All right. What's up, Hot Breath of Verse? Welcome to Comedians on Skype Talking Comedy, presented by the Hot Breath Comedy Network. If you're watching this on YouTube, welcome. Just so you know, the only way to participate in these live Q&As is to actually join our Facebook group. So go in the description and click that link to get in on more of these Q&As in the future. But for those of you lucky enough to be a member of this Facebook group, our guest today started comedy back in 2003 with comedians like TJ Miller, Pete Holmes, Hannibal Burris. He's delivered mattresses, he's delivered pizzas, he's delivered for FedEx, and now he is delivering the comedy goods exclusively to the Hot Breath Comedy Network. Welcome to the show, the one and only Nate Bargatze, everyone. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That's, normal, that's the normal response I get. Right. Yeah, complete silence. It's just like, all right. Yeah, you're used to selling out like theaters and uh, arenas now. So it's it, this is a little bit of a downgrade, I guess, for you. Uh, uh, it's, it, no, it's great. You know what's funny is I thought the music... So I was listening like Adele was playing. Uh huh. Ash, when I was like, I was like, is there music playing? You're like, oh, it's the music that plays in the thing. And I was like, okay. And then when you started, the music kept going, and I was like, there's, there's no way this music's just gonna play the whole time. It was my computer. Oh, okay. Because I was playing music I, over I was, here like, too. Losing my mind. <laughs> being like, I, we just had to talk over music the whole time. <laughs> like that's the. That's the thing. That's it's our like, that's uh, our that's our angle in on this podcast thing is we just play music and try to distract the guest into revealing all their secrets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is gonna be it all figured out. Are you in is that is that your office that you're in with all that like shiplap yeah. in the background? You're fancy, man. Yeah, yeah. Well it's yeah, it's wood. Is it shiplap? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I got house we bought it the good dude uh he did all this stuff, and then so I just we just I rolled with it, you know. Well, congratulations, first off, on all your success. I, I mean, I've been a fan for years. A lot of people in the chat have been fan for years. So it's cool to see a comic like you who just grinded it out, just stayed consistent, stayed funny, stay honing the craft, and now you're like a living example of what can happen if you just stick to it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, that's all. I mean, that's that's what it is. They all just want to. They you got to wait it out. That's all the, you know. I feel like comedy, uh, you know, like they they comedy wants you to get out, and if you don't stick through it, then you're never gonna see the end. You know, so you got to just keep going. What it? What has your been your experience? I've opened up all these Q and As with like just how. You personally are dealing with the current quarantine situation and maybe tips you have for comics and how we can maximize our time during this kind of unknown period. Hi, you saw to cancel a bunch of dates. I mean, I was supposed to be uh, like I was I was playing the Ryman in Nashville tomorrow. Mm. If this wouldn't have happened. And uh so, I mean, I had, a, I had a very full schedule. I was hoping to tape a special, or I think I'm still trying to tape a special at the end of this year. Uh, but I was, like, gearing up for that. Like, I was going to be, like, you know, I felt really good and, like, with the hour. And I was like, oh, by the time I get there, I'll be good and all that. So then it all just kind of came and went. And I think what it's made me realize is, you know, like, I don't have a podcast or anything like that. And but there's there's times this has definitely made me think about getting one just to like have this uh, another outlet like because you realize that you know the only thing we have is performing live or that that I have and so that that all got taken and so it's gone and you know there's other ways to do stuff and be creative uh, so it's made me think about that more like made me think like oh you know what else do you gotta fall back on you know mm-hmm. but I mean. If you're if you're if it's a newer comic, it's like because the problem is like you just have no uh, way to go be funny in a way, and so doing a lot of these, doing a lot of interviews or something, or like where I'm at least talking and having to be funny and doing friends podcast, that's a good that's a good thing to do during this time. Even if you do one a week, just to kind of keep your chops, like you know, uh, so that's been a huge help. And then, I mean, you know, and then look if you're if you're newer or something, it's like, I mean, yeah, it's try to start a podcast, try to start something. 
think of, you know, find some way to be creative, uh, you know, a new thing. I mean, I'm a big, like, I think you do need to focus on one thing, but this is kind of a unprecedented president time, like yeah. uh, the way it is. No one's dealt with this. And then, uh, so it's like now, yeah, go do whatever, you know, figure out yeah. throw your jokes out, write your jokes. Like, you know, I don't know, just be ready. So when it's time to come back, you're, you know, ready to go. Yeah. Just stay sharpening your creativity in whatever way that means to you seems to be like yeah. the best thing. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's been a lot of the advice is like, Learn new skills like Jeremiah Watkins was talking about. Figure out how to edit your videos. Like figure out how to add captions. Like do just do things that are gonna strengthen your brand for when all this does yeah. finally clear up, you're actually gonna be hitting the ground running and not like, oh wait, I was supposed to be working that whole time. You know, it's yeah. It's a job. That's actually a good, that that's a good like to edit your videos and put the captions in. That's a very, yeah, that's, uh, that's Jeremiah is great. And that's great, uh, advice. Cause that's something you got to do now. I mean, you got to mm-hmm. have like the social media posting your clips and it's got to have all the captions and all that stuff. And so that's actually very smart. I like that better than my dumb advice. <laughs> no. so. Yeah. You, you have a social media person, don't you? Like you outsource that job pretty much. I do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's that it's been huge. I mean, I've got, there's a lot of comics doing it now and, uh, yeah. I, I've got them all into some of them into doing it just because I was like, it's, it's been one of the bigger things for me is with the social media. I mean, obviously Netflix is the biggest thing, but like I've had people come to shows that only has seen my Instagram videos. They haven't even seen those whole specials. Wow. Like they would just be like, Oh, know you from this, you know, they just never watched an entire special. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a huge help. And that you're just constantly having these videos out. I mean, I had to think tick. We have the TikTok now. We're putting stand up clips on there. I've actually got everything kind of deleted off my phone. Instagram is about to be. I have it back on, uh, but I'm about to take it back off. I want to be out of it. Like, I definitely don't want to be like, especially during a time like this, you end up looking. I was like, you look at it too much. Uh, I don't like to be influenced. You know, uh, I, I don't really talk a lot of politics or topical things or whatever and social media is all of that and Mm -hmm. so like if i'm just looking at that it kind of steers your brain into like coming up with jokes in that world and i don't like that like i don't want to be you know social media can be so negative and so mean and all this stuff and so i don't want to just be like up there yelling about whatever and so like i ended up taking off and that's why i did have someone run it uh i mean i you know i i can afford to do that now versus if you're newer you obviously can't you know you're not making enough money to pay for something like that so you have to you know you have right. to do it but it's to keep you got to be just consistent we post something every day yep i get it like the people that do it for me they run through my clips you know i've been working with them for a year or so and they kind of know what to put and they know how to put his stuff up. That it's something that people ask a lot is like, cause they, you know, some thought I would be doing it. Like I've been unbelievable at it. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of work. And so it if is. you're a newer comic, it's like, yeah, you just got to suck it up and like, you gotta, you gotta do it. Part of the job. And it's part of the, yeah, you yeah. gotta be consistent on it, but it's like, you know, it's like you try not to get too overwhelmed in that world. Uh, you know, cause people get just caught up. I look at like stand up. I don't know. It's like social media, like being funny on social media. I just, there's no, uh, you're not going to get anything out of that. I believe like hmm. if someone's great and like, Oh, you should follow this person on social media. It's like, I mean, that person probably, you know, unless they're a, become huge or something. I mean, like they're not going to really sell tickets. No one's going to come see them, you know, because of whatever they're, because they're to watch read and hear about their tweets on stage and so you know i don't know it just seems like an outlet that's i i I don't know how much time you should put into it like as creative unless that's your thing unless you're really good yeah some people tore off of it it's just yeah it just depends on who you are but you're more of like the stage you're that's what i like you like everything you've built you've like you kind of alluded to it a second ago where it's like doing one thing really well instead of trying to do five things mediocre. Just focus on doing one thing really well. And that thing for you was stand up. And I like how you talked about social media 
it can become a distraction, especially for us as comedians. But one of my favorite quotes from you is when you said, what you read and think is what you'll create. And I think with comedians, we really do need to be mindful of what we are consuming because that will actually translate into what we end up creating. And that can be for the better or worse. Yeah. I mean, like if you need, say you're thinking about your act and you're like, oh, I need some more family stuff. It's like, well, then you need to go hang out with your family more. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, or I need, I want some mall material. Then you go walk around the mall for two days and see if you come up with stuff. And it's like, to me, that stuff becomes way more relatable than being like, you know, I mean, you're also trying not to write jokes that everybody's coming up with. Right. Like, I don't like coming up with topics that, you know, you know, I've been thinking about like this coronavirus thing. Like, so if I shoot a special kind of after this all lifts up and we can go back to perform, I, you know, I'll probably have a joke about the coronavirus, but it's like, I got to do one like that's not going to be done like everybody else. And so you got to think of, so you got to somehow find a way to do it. That's going to be different. Uh, so many people talk about the exact same stuff. So many people talk about stuff. Like, I mean, I had an old joke. I, I've brought it up before, like stuff, but like on the Tonight Show, I did a joke about saying I liked Donald Trump. This was when he was in the primaries. And the whole reason for that joke was just because everybody said they hated him. So that's the once the, everybody says it's one of the only topical things I've done. And it was still not topical. Uh, but it's I just wanted to try to be like, how can I do this? That everybody say every comedian says they hate him. So how can I say I like him? But without getting killed by, you know, everybody because you're saying something like that. And so you got to figure out those ways. You always just want to figure out a different angle. Mm. You know, that was an old like Jay Leno thing. They like I remember reading like out of one of like the comedy Bible or, or Judy, you know, one of those old books. Yeah. But they were saying like Jay Leno, like everybody had McDonald's joke. And then someone was like, well, have you seen Jay Leno's McDonald's joke? And it was like because his was the best and everybody else's was whatever. So, like, unless you think your joke is the best or different enough, then, uh, you know, then I don't know. There's no reason to dive into, like, a topic that everybody's doing. Yeah, that's – Like, you're just you're – just getting... I heard you talking about, like, Dave – people like Dave Chappelle and Bill Burr are killing it because they have a point of view on whatever it is they're talking about. Like, they actually bring – You want to know their point of view. Yeah, exactly. That's what you got to be. Yeah, if you want to do that stuff, then you got to be. It's got to be. You got to be at that. You know. I mean, you don't be at that level. You're. You'll eventually get at that level. But the point of it is, I we want to hear what they think about things, and so you're. They. That's what they do, and they give you that. They. You know. Mm -hmm. If you watch Bill Maher, like you're gonna go watch his show and be like, oh, I want to know this guy's opinion on all this stuff, or whoever it could be. And so unless you're do if that's your world, then yeah, dive into that side of things. And if your world's not that mine tends to not be that it's more stories and trying to be relatable. Uh, and so you, you do, I mean, do what I, you know, just talk about your life, like, and just make yourself, make it very, you know, personal in you as a comic. And then that helps when you make it personal, it just, you know, I don't know. Mm. You want – everybody's got to be – they do want your yeah. opinion. Everybody's got to be like, I want to see you. Mm -hmm. Like if you're – whether you're Chappelle or whoever, if you're – whether you're talking about politics or you're just talking about going to the gas station, everybody's got to want to see you, the comedian, go through that experience. So that's what you have to be able to – that's what you're kind of selling to the audience is you got to be like, here's me going through this. You want the audience to kind of be – when they watch it, they're like, I could see this guy doing this. This is what he does. Like that's that means they're buying into what you're mm -hmm. what you they, they know who you are. And that's when you get to like you get to another level where then you're like you kind of got your that's like a your voice like kind of thing where you get your voice and you're kind of like, all right, like, you know, I don't know. I get told a lot like people are like, oh, you remind me of my brother or something like that. That's like what I'm trying to do. Like, I'm not saying I started knowing that. Yeah. But like you want to be their brother, their friend. Or you want to be like, oh, you're like my husband or your wife's like my wife, like whatever, whatever they can do to like relate to you is, you know, the, the, the what you have to be doing. Yeah. And there's people in uh, the, the chat, definitely your, your style and delivery are something that a lot of, um, 
a lot of comedians, I've, I mean, I've talked to, I can't remember what comedian it was. It may have been like Sam Merrill, but it was like a lot of your jokes, I don't know if it's what you're saying or if it's how you're saying it, but it's like the math isn't always there, but it like crushes. And like, how were you able to bring in that, like, as comedians, we want to be more personable on stage and and like actually connect with people like you do with your audience. So what was that process of like finding your voice? Uh, I mean, you know, you still do it. Like I do think I, I never liked that. I know I'm just saying like what everybody always says, but like, uh, and the fact that like you never really find your voice, <laughs> you are always searching for your voice. There's still somewhat like I think uh, Mark Marin is one of the best at his voice. Like what he is on stage is pretty similar to off stage, and that's where your I think that's where your voice is is the fact that like unless you're doing like you know uh, Larry the Cable Guy or something like, mm -hmm. if you're doing something which is great like it's fine like but unless you're doing something that you're you know persona is just you're a character or whatever. Is it's trying to just be as similar as you are off stage on stage because once you do that, there's an old uh, as Louis C.K. said in an interview a long time ago about he went the older he got, it's like it's jokes are easier to write because everything you say is funny and everybody like kind of thinks what you say is funny because you that means you have your voice. That means everything that you say is like the way I say it or what the way I do whatever is like funny. So you get. And it's a slippery slope because you got to be careful with it because you don't. That's how you can become bad too, mm. is because you people are, are people like you know are just like yeah they're laughing at everything and you're not getting like a true test of like yeah. is this stuff good or not. You're just because they like you. Like now when I go on stage, we're doing theaters and people are very excited. So when I go out, I can tell that like they're excited to see me. They're excited to be in the room, and but you got to make sure that you're still bringing it or otherwise you're like, I mean, you could really drop off and it become a problem. Uh, but anyway, finding your voice is like, it just takes a long time. I always, when I, I never, I've never sat down and wrote word for word. Uh, I've tried that. There was an old Patrice and Bill. I remember Patrice O'Neill, I think him and Burr, uh, they told me that like, it was like, you didn't want to write it out word for word. You, cause if you don't do that, it'll kind of change every time, like every time you say it and not not the bones of the joke. The joke's going to be working the same way, but your ands and your us and your these and like the little sentences like that, that stuff changes. And then that rhythm kind of changes. And so it kind of feels it's very conversational. And so you're trying to kind of like or what I try to do is you're trying to hide the joke a little bit. So you're trying to hide. You know, I'm trying to talk the way that I talk mm -hmm. and I always get told I say like a lot and, you know, uh, but it's like it's just how I, people talk. So I'm talking pretty much the way that I talk or trying to talk as close as I can to the way that I can. And then I always try never to be too far away from a laugh, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's even the tiniest laugh, if it's anything, it's I try to always stay the farther you get away from a laugh, the bigger that next laugh has to be. So I never want to put that much pressure on one laugh. I mean, obviously, the biggest laugh I want to be at the end of the joke. Uh, but I never want to put too much pressure on one laugh, like one joke or one sentence. I mean, you, so it needs to be either very interesting in what you're saying. doesn't always have to be funny, but very like people want to hear what you're saying. They're like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Or it needs to be a big laugh, you know, or, or even just little laughs, but just you're, you know, I think I try to consistently have laughs the entire hour. I've always done it with everything. You just, yeah, yeah. you never want to be too far away. You never want to, you know, just you, the farther you get away from laugh to be like, you know, like if you tell a story where there's no laugh for two minutes, I mean, this story better end with a standing ovation. Like, yeah. You, you just put that much pressure on. They can't just do an easy, quiet laugh when you're done with the nothing. <laughs> right. Like yeah. that's, you know, I've that's, heard it's no like a payoff. balloon where like the, the further between the laps, the bigger the balloon gets. So the bigger the pop better be. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So just, I always try to keep it, you know, just kind of keep it going all the way through. Uh, and you can feel it. You can tell when you're like, Oh, I need something else. Yeah. Like something needs to be there. And then so you add a little funny, dumb thing. Some of it's just dumb things that you're adding just to 
keep them listening and then, you know, and then you to get your payoff. And can you take us to the moment you're talking with Bill Burr and Patrice O'Neill at the same time? Is this, I guess you're used to it because you uh, like developed in New York, but like as comedians, we hear these names and we're like, wait, what? So they, uh, well, I started, so when I moved to New York, so I was in Chicago, then I moved to New York with Pete Holmes. I did exactly Crashing. I did that with Pete Holmes. That's so cool. I barked at Boston Comedy Club with Pete. Pete got me barking. And so we stood on the corner and all that stuff. So that's where Bill and Patrice and them would come in. So uh, Patrice was, I think, would have been probably one of the greatest ever. And yeah. he's the, he's like, you know, I would, if you could bring someone back alive, I mean, I would bring him back over anybody, over Chris Farley. Like, I just want to hear what he has to say about everything. But I went to their HBO one night stand taping. They have, they both did a half hour and I watched that. And I used to, I mean, I used to sit in Patrice, Patrice would park his car and I would sit in it in case. So I'd move it if a cop came because he'd park it. You can't, there's no la parking. And so I would just sit in it and drive around the block if a cop came. Uh, when they were running their half hours, I would time their sets. What? Like I timed Patrice's. Well, he did not ask me to do it. <laughs> I would just do it. Like, you know, like the eager comedian and you're just trying to be helpful. And right. you're like, I was like, Hey man, I timed your, I know you only got to do 30 minutes. So I timed your set. You were like at 33 minutes. And I remember he was like, all right. And then just kind of walked away. <laughs> like it was cause he didn't ask for that. And now that I know, like in my head, I'd never, I've never done anything TV wise. So I thought you had to be exactly at that time, you know, but for that HBO one, I said, you're like, yeah, dude, he could have done 45 minutes and they would cut it down to 30. Like mm-hmm. it didn't really matter. And, uh, you know, and so, but it was watching those guys was huge. Burr is my, that's my guy. That's my biggest, you know, I mean, luckily now I'm friends with Burr and, uh, you know, I don't talk to him a ton, but uh, but I've been very. I remember mean, good. I w- went with him on the road, and that's awesome. But he was the guy that was huge for me. Like I watched because he was one of the first guys where he was like kind of hitting his stride in the clubs. It was. I mean, I remember the first first Letterman he ever did. I was barking like handing out flyers on the corner for Boston Comedy Club, and I remember turning. And I was like, hey, we got a great comedy show. And I gave one to Bill Burr. And I was like, ah, oh, man, I'm so sorry. I was like embarrassed. Like, I was like, I'm so sorry. I, I just didn't. I was just kind of turned. Like, I didn't know. And then he was like, ah, it's fine, man. And he's like, and he was doing his first letterman. And he was like, hey, do you, I need to go run it. Do you know any shows? And I mean, of course, like, I'm a new comic. So I'm like, yeah, dude, there's this show and this show. And I'm like telling him all the shows that he could go to to run it. Uh, but he was like a big deal because I he was the first guy that when I came to New York, you know, your like world is open up to like, you know, when you're before you start comedy, all you know is like Seinfeld or Cosby or, you know, whoever, like whoever the famous Chris Rock. You, you don't know about guys that you don't know who they are. And then when you get into comedy and you start seeing people like I saw Bill Burr, who's nobody at this point, not even he's about to do his first letterman. And I'm like blown away. Like I'm like, this is a bananas, dude. I mean, the first, same way with Brian Regan. First time I heard Brian Regan's CD, I just couldn't wrap my head around because it was 2003. So he's not famous. You know, he's, he's probably selling out comedy clubs uh, or he is selling out comedy clubs at that point. But I remember hearing it and I just couldn't believe I was like, how is this guy not the most famous person alive? Like, I didn't understand. You know, I was like, this is the funniest human being I've ever heard in my life. How is he not just how is he not like on Mount Rush? Like, I, it's like this guy's. It's crazy, dude. No one's as funny as this guy. So your world gets expanded and you're like, oh, everybody, there's a lot of really, really good comedians. And so then you get to sit and I just watched Bill Burr a lot. I watched Burr, I mean, obsessively. I've, you know, I'd watch him at all the clubs. I'd watch him. I remember going to Caroline's and he's not even had the, the rooms not even sold out at Caroline's. I remember his opening Anthony, the famous Philadelphia incident. I remember when it happened, he came back and was telling us about it before it kind of blew up on YouTube. Wow. Uh, we were asking, he was like, guys, oh, the show was crazy. Like, I mean, he was, you know, not that I've really ever told him any of this stuff. Cause obviously I wouldn't, it'd be very weird and awkward. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, we've said, we've said alone too. I mean, I've asked him questions. Like I've talked to him about like, those days because uh i did kind of tell him like how like seeing him and patrice and asking about 
just because I was a younger comic watching all that and asking him about that stuff. But it was, uh, but yeah, I mean, he was everything, man. He was, he's a, it's, it's one of the biggest deals for me was, uh, and that I still do watch him is yeah. just to watch his path. You need to see comics paths. Mm. So you need to find a comic that like, you know, I always would say you got to have a comic uh, above you and below you. You need to have like someone that you talk to that's right above you. And then you need to talk and you need to help someone that's right below you in comedy because you need to, you know, it, there's no point in going. If you're starting today, you don't need to go talk to Ray Romano about stand up. You're you have nothing to relate. He hasn't done open mics in 30 years. Like there's nothing he can really tell you, you know, besides like the basic information that you would get is like just work hard, write jokes, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But you need to talk to someone that's like two years in because that person would know more than anybody that's that's the, what you need to learn is what to do in two years versus what to do in 20 years and then you i always think you'd have someone below you so you can re-say this stuff to someone because you need to constantly be hearing yourself say it so you need to be saying it and helping someone else you know below you and kind of talk and that way you're always just talking about comedy you know yeah always be upset. boom great advice so let's uh let's get into these other uh these uh questions in the comments. I could sit here and interview you all day, but I know people are also wanting to um jump in here with their questions as we do here. So the uh the first one, I think it's only right. This is a comedian from Chicago actually, where you started. So uh his name's Mitt Wolf and his question is I'm in year three, still open micing. If you could do your first three years all over again, would you do anything differently? If so, what? Ooh. I, uh, you know, I'm not a, I would always, I never do say do anything different. I always say you got to do, you got to learn everything uh, through experience. Hmm. So there's not like something that you could be like, well, go do this. Like you're not going to be good enough to go do this. But you realize like when you're first starting when you're in, in, in three years, you know, so I was in, I mean, if you're, he's in Chicago, Chicago is much different than I was when I started. Uh, I think now they've got much more of a scene and people can be there and you can actually be seen in Chicago. Like they come and, you know, if you want to do anything, you, I mean, you can do it anywhere now. Mm -hmm. uh, so I try to think three years. I mean, I moved to, I was in Chicago, then I moved to New York and then I started barking. I mean, I, I wouldn't do any of those things different. I never have like great, uh, I never have great, like, you know, trying to think like any like old stuff that I'd be like, I wish I knew this or I wish I knew that. Cause I, I mean, you got to go through all this stuff. If you're not out there, that's the only thing you have to be doing it every night. Boom. You have to like, I'm a big look. If you have a girlfriend, a wife, husband, whatever, if they are in your way and you try to like be like, yeah, well, I got to do stuff with my girl. Like I can't like go do all this stuff. Then you just won't make it probably like because you're, you know, I, I say this a bunch and a lot of things, but no one cares that you're trying to be a comedian. No one needs you to be a comedian. No one needs me to be a comedian. No one needs Bill Burr to be a comedian. We're all choosing a job that's like winning a lottery ticket. You're choosing a career where you can make zero dollars or you can make Nine hundred and fifty million dollars, like Seinfeld. Like that's your window. Your window, it can be all over the place. You can make a million. You can make no whatever. So if you don't obsess over it, then you will never do it. Because if you're not obsessing over it, someone else is obsessing over mm. it, and they will take your spot. The fact that they will just be around. You just got to be around. You got to be, even if you're not doing stand up every night. Like you just have to be where everybody knows you're a stand up. Everybody knows you're doing stuff and you got to be soaking everything in. Uh, I don't know if that answers this question, but yeah, yeah three years sure. in, like just keep doing, you know, you got to keep doing what you're doing. Uh, you know, I mean, you can obviously probably maybe think about moving to New York or LA. I live in Nashville. Now I moved a little bit. I lived, I was in Chicago, New York for nine years, LA for two. Uh, so it, I think it is good to be, but Chicago is at least, if you're, you didn't want to move to New York or L.A., Chicago is at least, you know, the best besides that. Yeah, and this also can tie into a, a, a big question, just the show gets in general, is about 
um, taking the leap to go full time. Now you seem to take like, and this is how I became full time was more of a gradual route where you would actually work. You would bark and do shows late at night and then stay up for your job at FedEx at 5 a.m. And you would just stay up all night and then go straight into work. But what was that process of going full time? And then this can also tie into Earl Anderson. And also he asked any advice on self-doubt. So like what was your transition to going full time? And how did you deal with the self-doubt along the way? I was a little bit lucky in the fact that like I got married in 2006. So then my wife, when she moved to New York, she got a job. She had a job oh, that gotcha. was good. And I was I was probably making Twenty grand in comedy in like 2006, so I was able to kind of like I did a couple like temp jobs, but then around 2006 seven I was able to kind of like basically just be doing comedy, and I was making like twenty like like I said like twenty grand, and so I remember I just wanted to get to make whatever job I would have out like I, I didn't go to college, so I wasn't ever going to have some big high paying job. So I was like, if I wait tables, if I can make what I would be making waiting tables in comedy, mm -hmm. that's all I needed. So if I could make $30,000 or whatever, I was like, then I'll be fine. And I'll, that's, you know, that's what I'd be doing anyway. I have no education. Like mm -hmm. I'm not gonna have some big, big paying job. So like, I would just always try to like, just, you have those little goals. You never want to get too big on your goals because they're going to be pretty tough to reach if you're five years in and you're like my goal is to make a million dollars well you could be you could be one year away you could be 20 years away from that so you always want to have goals that are that that can be reached your goals shouldn't be too high you know when i was watching bill burr and when i was starting out my goal was just to get off that corner i didn't want to hand out those flyers i didn't want to stand out in 20 degree weather and hand out flyers so that was my only goal and so I did whatever I had to do to get off that corner and then I can go and then go to the next step. And then my next goal was to like, I don't know, like to, I wanted no one to ask me to bark because I used to always get, yeah, you can do my show, but I need you to hand out flyers. And so I was like, I wanted to get to the point where they would be embarrassed to ask me to, to hand out flyers. They'd be like, well, we can't ask Nate. So then you're just, you're, you're, then I was just trying to get to that goal. So when you have those, you can be much more aggressive towards those goals because they're not as high mm. as you know they should be. Your goals will constantly change. They're always going to change. Whatever your dreams are, they, it can change. I want to do a sitcom. Uh, I've tried eight times and have been told no eight times. And it is what it is, man. Like it's been the hardest thing to do. Uh, but, it, you know, whatever, man, it's taken forever. And I mean, I'm in the circles doing it. We shot a pilot. We did everything. Wow. It didn't work out. And so uh, you got to just keep doing it. Like you're going to get told no. You know, uh, Mike Vecchione, who you're about to interview, one of my best friends, one of the I say this one of his quotes all the time, which he, maybe he's going to say it. Uh, <laughs> I but hope so. he was like, he's like, he would always say, you got to get the nose out of the way. And I always mm. loved it. Like. So you got to get you got to get told no out of the way. So you're going to get if you try to like get on a show that you know they're not going to have you. Well, you need to go ahead and get told no by them. So go like you know it's like don't do it too or don't be ridiculous. Like you know if you're like I've done four shows and I'm trying to go do, you know the comedians you should know show whatever that show in Chicago if it's still there. But that was that show used to be unbelievable. But if you were like an open mic or trying to get on that show, it's like that's ridiculous. But if you're like, I feel like I'm ready, it's like, yeah, then maybe go ask them. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to get told no and get your nose out of the way. You got to get your nose out of the way. Great. All right. Well, this is um, this could be a no. Paul Schneider says, is Nate looking for a socially distant BFF? If so, I'm willing to step up. So, <laughs> No. That's, 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 that's his first no. Congrats, so, Paul. He does two more of those and then he's going to be in, like, you know. <laughs> The first no is out of the way. We're going to do one more no, and then we'll be yes. Awesome. So let's, let's you know, getting it started. We're changing lives here, Nate. Yeah. All right. The next comes from Skip Angel. He's out in Louisiana. He says, do you have a particular writing exercise or discipline you use often? I So I've, I've never written uh, word for word. I've never – I've tried it. I've written it in a notebook. I remember sitting down and making myself do it. I honestly don't. I'm scared 
every day that I don't know if I'll ever come up with another joke. Mm. Uh, I've lived in constant fear of that. I have no system to make myself come up with these jokes. There's a lot of trust in myself that I think it's going to happen. I, uh, I mean, you know, when I did my, when I did full time magic on Comedy Central, I, I mean, I was like, I'll never write jokes that good ever again. Like I'm done. And then I did the stand ups, and I was happy with that. And then after the stand ups, you're like, well, I don't know whatever I'll do again. Then you have to see it. You always, you never feel you should. You should never feel like you're you write a great joke and you're like, I don't know how I'll ever top that joke. You're in constant fear and panic that you're never going to come up with anything. I'm scared. I have a new hour and I'm scared after that hour. As I do, I can catch myself on stage as I'm doing this new hour and I'll be thinking, how can I ever come up with more material? Like I'm, I think that as I'm telling these new jokes, because I'm just so I'm like, I came up with these. It's going to go away at some point, you know, like you like I don't I always thought like I wish I made myself right in the fact that I wish I had this system in place that I could do it. Hmm. Now, all that being said, I don't have any of that system in place. Maybe it doesn't work for you. Comics are, you know, for how hard we work, we're also some of the laziest people alive. <laughs> and so but I know that. I keep I keep note, a notepad in my uh, you know on my phone and I type these notes down. And so when I do come up with a new joke, I do think of it a lot, and I just you know I can make myself my brain kind of get into searching mode. Like there'd be times I'll be like, you know, at, with my new hour, I wanted uh, I wanted like uh, maybe one or two more wife jokes. Mm -hmm. Like I, I wanted a couple more wife things. So I was just a little more conscious. I just kind of opened myself up to like going like, all right, I need some wipe stuff. And you just kind of tell your brain that and you kind of just, I don't know, then it makes you more aware. Sometimes I'm like, I don't want any more family stuff. I want something that's like not family. And so then I'll just, you know, you got to go do stuff. That was a big uh, Bill Burr thing. Go have experiences. Mm. Go do something crazy. Like, you know, I'm writing a joke about Chuck E. Cheese and I came up with this or this thing that uh, – with Chuck E. Cheese, and I've actually gone with my daughter a few times just trying to get material. She has fun, and then I get to kind of have the experience so I can – because I, I want a couple of other things. So it's it's go have these experiences. You know, I know, look, Seinfeld writes. He, you know, has his – makes himself write every day. Maybe it's like go around, look on the internet. I've downloaded little apps. I have this curiosity app uh, that just puts, like, weird facts out. Sometimes I'll go through those. Sometimes it's just like getting your brain like kind of thinking in a different thing. Yeah. But that's where you don't go too crazy and don't get on social media too much because then you end up – you don't want everything to be negative unless that's your thing, unless you're, you know, unless you're a comic that wants to be like that. But you can be very influenced with that stuff, and you, then you end up writing a joke that's like very like, let me tell you, you know, yep. all this stuff, like yelling at everybody. Great advice. So, yeah, and that's something I, I really appreciate about you is that you draw from things outside of comedy as well. Like your inspiration to move to New York was sparked by hearing a quote that wasn't even re related to comedy. Yeah, well, that was that was my move to L.A. Oh, was it the New move York to L.A.? Spark, oh, OK. Yeah, the, the New York spark was the movie Comedian. Oh, OK. I the was Seinfeld in Chicago. Movie. Yeah, you went I to saw the that theaters in, yeah, alone, right? <laughs> Went to the movie theater alone yeah. <laughs> uh, and watched that. Watched it a million times. Uh -huh. And uh, I've got to know Warney Adams, who's a great dude. Wow. By the way. Uh, comes off in that. I know. He just <laughs> very, very funny, too. Very fun. Like, he's a comic that's like a killer, man. Like, it would be, I would always hear stories, too, about, like, you know, Bob Marley? You yeah. Know, you know, I heard it. He's like, he uh, runs the Northeast. Yes. Yeah. And so, like, I've met Bob Marley, but I remember, like, Bobby Kelly would always, like, talk about, like, Bob Marley would murder. Uh -huh. Like, and like, I love, that's something that newer comics need to have in them that I think there's there, cause there's a mix of comedy that I think there's a lot of comics now that like laughter is not the most important thing to them. And it's about mm. like being or whatever, whatever it is. Right. So if you look at, like, I came up in the New York times and like where guys would murder dude, like Ben Bailey, uh, Greer Barnes, I mean, murder, like you would. <laughs> <laughs> or using, they can't believe they're watching this kind right. of stuff. That needs to happen. Yes. If that needs to come back, it's like 
there's a new way of people writing, I think, comics writing jokes where they're very safe. They're like, it's like, well, like none of their stuff is very funny. So if you don't laugh, it's like, it's kind of fine. because None of it's really that funny. It's all like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. Like all that kind of stuff. Right. And that's weak. Like, yeah, I if agree. you <laughs> making uh, writing material, that's a whole this is I'm going off a tangent. The whole crowd work idea, too, is it, I mean, it infuriates me like <laughs> you know, is writing a new hour of material. That's the hardest thing you can do. I'm not saying don't do crowd work. I'm not saying I'll, I like crowd work. Most a lot of friends do crowd work. I've done crowd work. I get it. I'm not saying I'm against it. But if, I think if you want to go to a, the highest level of a stand up comedian, you have to have material. You have to write material. Crowd work is, you know, there's only so many divorced people in the, you know, what are you divorced in the crowd? What are you interracial couple? What do you like? There's only so many different types of people in the crowd. So like you crowd work can, can, can beca- become very stock jokes. It can become, you know, you're just doing the same jokes to a different audience, but they don't know, but they feel like it's very personal. And so again, I'm not anything against crowd work. I'm not saying it's a, it's not a bad thing to learn and be able to do, but the hardest thing you can do as a comic is write an, an hour of material. You're writing a joke that people don't know you and they laugh at. Mm. That's and you're not of someone like you're not like going like what is this? look at this guy's shirt like that's you're you're creating something in your dumb brain <laughs> is my dumb brain yeah. that the people that I've never met laugh and they that's unreal and that's that's the hardest thing to do and so that's something that I think comics. I hope this younger generation that comes up, it's like, get back to like murder. I agree. Man. Like, I agree. Stage and like, you know, I always would say like, get a five minutes that, that, you know, destroys like, if you know, you got to get a five minute set that think about like, if Jimmy Fallon walked in and says, you want to do the tonight show? I need to see your best five minutes. You should know exactly what that five minutes is that you would do. Don't be like, well, I got a bunch of stuff. Know what that is. And that, that it's jokes that you need to have worked out and worked through and like done them multiple times. I know it's hard when you're first starting, you're doing open mics and it's kind of the same comics in the crowds. Uh, it's like try to figure a way to get in front of a real audience or, you know, and if you do a bunch of open mics, if you don't feel there's a lot of people doing it, but you should all be trying to work on jokes mm-hmm. and learn how to make it great. That's a huge, huge thing. Sorry, I don't know what this is even about. No, that was pretty, right. no, that was. I love <laughs> you. Just like you got a murder. It's like how New York comics talk about you. Just got a murder, dude. Like Robert Kelly would say, you got to kill, dude. You got to kill. <laughs> got to kill. It, it's just, it's the hardest thing to do, mm. and so I not try to do the hardest thing to do. I think people get. Say, I remember a comic a long time ago starting, and uh, he got off stage. And it was like, whatever, like the set was bad. <laughs> it was like, and whatever. So I, yeah. I, like I almost walked up to him and I was like, you know, we were just doing some dumb bar show. And so I was like about to, I was about to say to him, I was like, ah, oh, this crowd stinks dude. Like I bombed too. And, uh, before I could say it, he was like, it's pretty good. And I realized I was like, oh, that guy's never heard himself murder. <laughs> so like he thinks that was good and it was awful. <laughs> and if you, if you don't get laughs, you won't train yourself. To be like thinking I'm doing good uh-huh. <laughs> and you're not getting black because that's that's what happens everywhere you go. So if you don't know what a hard laugh of a, from a crowd sounds like, you never know what to get to. And if you don't, and so if you don't have it, and I, mean, I remember that was a big moment for me just to hear him like be like, "Ah, oh, that was good," and I was like, "What?" <laughs> like in my, in my head, <sighs> just go easy, dude. Like. You got zero laugh. It was uncomfortable yeah. to be in the room. He is used to being uncomfortable. So he thought it was fine. So before we get to the next question, what was what was the quote you heard that inspired you to move oh. to LA? Wintraub, he was like, I think he was like Elvis is well, he worked with Elvis. Like he was a dude that did Oceans Eleven and a uh-huh. big producer. Died not too long ago. So I read his book and it was just about him starting. And then his career, he's got a crazy career. It's a great book. And so he said, I, when he was like, a, he was in the, maybe an agent at WME in New York or something. And he said in the book, he said he knew anytime he started feeling comfortable, it was time to make a change. 
And so then he moved to L.A. Mm, okay. And when I read that quote, I moved two months after I read that quote. I moved to Los Angeles from New York because I knew that made so much sense to me. And it's the best quote I've ever heard is the fact that, like, if you start building comfort, like the, the guy that was living in Chicago. Yeah. If you're living in Chicago and you're having no trouble getting on any show in Chicago, you can get up as much as you want. And you're kind of looked at as like uh, one of the older comics or a higher level comic. Then you have to move and you need to shake it up. If you don't, you will get stuck. I, you are just get stuck there and you're just going to be the older guy and new comics are going to come and they're going to pass you and they're going to move. And then you're going to end up, you can start becoming bitter and you can start and then it's gone and it's over. You're never like, I felt like that when I was in New York. I knew a lot of comics and my friends stay in New York, but I knew when I was in New York, I got passed. My goal was to get passed at all the comedy clubs. So once I got passed at all the comedy clubs, I knew like, all right, I need to change it up. I need to go put my, I, I, I was getting up everywhere. I wanted to get up. I did a half hour Comedy Central special. I did late night shows. I did all this stuff. But I knew that I needed to change it up because I was getting too comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I moved to L.A. When I first moved to L.A., I was like, you know, I had a half hour on Comedy Central. Uh, you know, I, I like did a bunch. I had like four Conans. I had all this stuff. And then one night, I remember I was supposed to open, uh, I was supposed to do a show with Burr. And Burr like ended up rescheduling. And I went and did an open mic on like a Friday. And I mean, I felt like panic because I mean, I have, you know, I have more TV credits than most of these people, but nobody cared that I had these TV credits. It's not like I walked into LA and I was like, I'm here. Let me on stage as much as I want. Mm -hmm. So I, I had like, I mean, I, I panicked in the fact that like, Oh, I got to get it to get like, and so then you just start going, like, I got to go start going back out every night. And I was just hanging out at shows, man. Like I wasn't getting up on all these shows and I had more credit. Like you just can't, you know, <laughs> all these things I think you should be allowed to like walk in, but I wasn't. So I just had to go hang out and, and get back to the grind that I was in. And I wasn't feeling that in New York, that panic uh -huh. anymore. Start feeling that panic. And then you start like, and then I moved to New York and then I started like, dude, I would do like my greatest hits in New York. I would just, you know, murder. Yeah. Like I always say, <laughs> you know, shows and murder. Like it was, I mean, uh, uh, like I remember Louis Cat. Louis Katz is another one of my yeah. close friends. Like he was in moved to New York, and I remember he first came, and he like he would always be trying these new jokes. I was like Louis, I go nobody's seen you. Like the same way no one's seen me in L.A. I was like you got to murder, dude. Like when you move to a new city, go do your best of your best jokes. Like make a point to when you get on these shows. You destroy because then everybody starts going like, Dee. like it's like it's another level because all and then people are like, whoa, and then you start getting on other shows and then all this falls into place. And then you've moved up a lot quicker in this new city. Mm -hmm. than if you went and like was like, I'm just going to do my new jokes still every night, like no one's going to care. Like you're going to you, you get in the mix, go murder. If you do an open mic and you're in a new town, that's the greatest thing in the world. When you go on the road and go to some town's open mic. Right. And you would right, get right. to do your <laughs> would just slaughter like yeah. you're just like the like that's the best that's what you you're looking for that feeling to be like yeah dude i'm from i live in new york this is what we do you know yeah they don't know like, those jokes still, are five years old yeah, <laughs> they, like, yeah you're like you're working on, but you just go to this new place and just murder it's great yeah so that's what's great, and this ties into the next question. And um, we're going to try to start uh, firing through these questions here. Um, this is Lee Hudson says, uh, that's what's great. You murder, but with your energy. It's like you're not like Godfrey, like just built, like blowing up the room with energy. You're like you, and it still murders. And Lee asks, um, do you think it took people a while to get your low energy style? I had to because I followed Godfrey. Woo. It was following Godfrey and Sylvans and like all of them in New York. I learned that I had to like I can't match their energy. If I I remember one time doing a show with Rory Scovel, and I remember I try to match Rory Scovel's. Mm -hmm. You know he's a weird and loud and yep. yell and all this stuff. So Rory's very easy to like like be like I want to do that because it seems very fun. And I tried it one night after him and I bombed. And Jay, Jay Larson was there and he's like, yeah, why are you trying to match his energy? And I was like, you're right. I shouldn't have, I should have just done me. So you got to do what you do. And so what I learned to do a quick, easy way to get people into your rhythm is you get your first joke or two is, is going to not work. 
But that's how you get them into like, so I learned that I need them to hear my voice. So I would always start very weird and awkward. I would always go on stage and I still do it. And I, I go on stage. I'm like, all right, here we go. I hope this goes good. Maybe this is not going to go good. I don't know. Like, I don't even really care. You, you're going to get laughs just for, but those are not important laughs. I'm just trying not to make my first joke, not get a laugh. So I'm saying a bunch of dumb stuff oh. to make them hear my voice, get into my rhythm uh and then they go okay and then the audience is like all right i know what this guy does and then you get into your first joke and now i've got them into the way i talk like i i've always had to learn how to get them into my tone so just go on stage and whatever you do just say dumps you know be like oh all right here we go this is i hope this goes good whatever your you know right persona if you if you're you know like a, a cocky persona you could be like this is going to be the best part you got you could yell that it's just kind of throw away stuff so that the audience can then hear your voice. So it's not just a shock, you know? Gotcha. And this, this can also, uh, Trent Babb has a, he says your jokes seem conversational, which I guess that ties into your rhythm. Your song is your conversational yeah. style. So with it being more conversational, do you have a writing partner that you talk things out with? No, I'll, I'll try them sometimes with just for my friends. I mean, I don't have someone specifically, mm -hmm. uh, but I'll call comics and be like, you know, my the guy that opens with me, like Brian Bates, like me and him talk a lot about, is this funny? And then I'll say it. I kind of know before the joke ever hits the stage if it's funny or not. I've I've like thought about it enough. And it, the older you get, the longer you do comedy, you can tell when you're like, I've never been a guy that I don't throw every joke on stage. I would see a lot of guys do that when people would always be like, you know, I remember going on the road, we do like a show. And then we go do some other like local show and they're like, I'll just do this new stuff. I've never tried. And I never understood that. Cause I was like, I just did all my new stuff on the state. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't, I, I never have just like 20 minutes of jokes sitting on the sideline. Everything that I think of is out there. Maybe there's new ideas I haven't put into play yet, but it's not many. I mean, I don't have like a surplus of just, you know, I don't have a book of just 50 ideas right. that I've never tried. Everything that I try, everything that I come up with, it's either I'm trying to put it in my act at that moment or it's gone or like I won't do it again. Maybe I think of it again later on. Uh, but like it's I don't just sit and have this stuff like sitting on the sideline. Everything I, I put everything goes out there and to keep stuff conversational. A great way to do it is to either do like when you do radio interviews and you got to be funny during radio yeah. interviews. It's a great way, like. What they tell you, you got to do your act, like be funny. Like that's a, you know, you're trying not to do your act straight up. And then also just tell it, see if you can put it in a conversation with some friends and stuff. Great way for it to learn to be conversational. So you don't just sound like you're just doing your stand up, like, you know, at a party. You just kind of like try to like, you know, it's basically like you're telling someone, hey, is this funny? And then you kind of tell them and then see what their reaction is. Yeah, I've heard you even say you'll kind of talk through jokes like while you're doing dishes and stuff. Just in passive time, you'll also kind of be working out. I think about it all the time. Yeah. If I have a new joke, I'm constantly – it's running through my head. And I and I and and so when I take it to the stage, it's, it's almost already been done in mm -hmm. my head a hundred times. So it's not like I'm like – I'm not totally reliant on the audience. And I'll put it in like the middle – I. Actually, I open with a lot of new stuff. Like I'm a big like with I have an hour. You know, now doing an hour, uh, I I open with uh, usually new stuff because I'm just so excited about it. Mm -hmm. That's something you got to do when you when you start doing when you start headlining and do an hour. You sometimes got to move stuff around because you get you get tired of some stuff, and so then you need to put new stuff in front of that, or you got to leave a new thing towards the end just so you're excited to get to that end. Yeah. So you're not. Because your energy will change. Once you get past the new stuff, then you're just kind of like going through the motion. All right. This is uh, Jason P. Leonard. He says, I booked you. He books the, he's Lafayette Comedy in Louisiana. He books all that. Mm -hmm. Great shows. He says, yeah, yeah. I booked you in 2015 weekend of your brother's wedding. You were a week off first tonight show appearance. You were great and talked shop to all the local comics. Uh, it's been a pleasure to watch you blow up. If there was one joke you could steal from any comedian and make it your own, what would it be? Uh, I mean, there's going to be plenty. Golly, I don't know. I don't know if I can think of one on the spot. Uh, I was trying to, like, 
Uh, I don't know. I can't think of it. I can't think of one on the spot. It's okay, Nate. Don't beat uh, yourself up, buddy. I always loved, you know, the, the Louis C.K. joke when he said uh, when he was with his family on vacation, and uh, when he goes to va- vacation on his family, the only his his only vacation is when he shuts his wife's door and walks around the van to his side yes. of the door. And that's just <laughs> like so. That would be one that I would like. That that would that would fit very much into my act. So like that's why I would want that joke because like that's. Something that, you know, sometimes you can, there's a lot of jokes that you love. You're like, I can never say those jokes. That one I could say. And that one I would love to have. Mm-hmm. So that would be one. Um, this one, uh, there's no face with it, but it says, was it your idea to do the track titles on your first two albums? It added another dimension of humor to them. Uh, yes. So, uh, when we first were, they were telling me how to do the track titles and how to go through them and come, come, come with them up again. The most common way everybody does it is you just name, you know, Walmart wife, like whatever the thing is. Uh, and so I, I was like, what if I come up with some, a different way? Kyle Kinane came up with a unique way. I forget what, I think he did like CD names of our tracks of like an, an album of music album. You know, Daniel Tosh did one, two, three, four. He just did numbers. So a way that I came up with is it, mine is like the first one yelled at by clown was like thoughts in my head during the show. Mm-hmm. And then I've done like a conversation with my daughter. And then maybe I did another one the other way I did it. So now I've just started doing it that way. So, yes, it was my way to come up with it. It's actually backfired on me in the fact that like I had to do some old jokes because I was doing like a, when I do a corporate gig. I'll pull out like. The greatest hits. Of course. Like, again, like I'm going right. back to that, like trying to murder. <laughs> right. So I'm just yanking the my top greatest hits I've ever done. So I'll go back and listen to an old album, and because I didn't name them correctly, I could find some jokes, and it was infuriating. <laughs> I was like sit there, and I'm trying to find like this thing to listen to this old joke so I can remember it, and uh, I'm like, what a stupid way to name these titles. I just had no <laughs> idea where it was, and like it took me a while to find it. So. All right, and uh, let's do the final one here, maybe before some um, closing advice for comics. This is from Max Price, and thank you to everyone that um, posted your questions, and I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but um, I think we still got we still got a lot of good information out, but this one's from Max Price, who uh, asked, did you hold on to material for more than a year before your first album, or have you always written usable material as quickly as you do now no i held on to it just now i'm starting now with once the stand-ups came out that was when i started had to throw stuff away do not throw stuff away Mm. don't think you record an album you have to be doing that my yelled at by a clown album i have a lot of my stuff on my comedy central special and on the presents because just uh, like not to be mean but when you first put your first album out, nobody cares. No one's going to listen to it. It's, I mean, nobody, you will you never run into a problem of people being like, this is from his album. Like maybe you have a couple people comment it that are like real fans and they've been there for a long time. But when you're first starting, you do your first album. Like if you get a special, you need to put everything that you did on the album on that special. Bill Burr's stuff is, I think, the same. Mm. Uh, everybody, I talked to Tommy Jonigan about it one day, like, and he was like, "Yeah, you put the best stuff out." We think like we're supposed to be like Louis C.K. doing an hour every year when you're five years in, and nobody knows your stuff, dude. Like, so when you get your first chance, put it all out there. Like, do your greatest way. Like, so if you're if you even if you've done two albums, you know, and then. HBO comes and goes, I want to do an hour special. Yeah, then go grab your two stuff from that album. Like now, if you have a, there's circumstances, obviously, if you have a big fan base from your albums or whatever, then maybe you do need to change it up. But like in general, you, when you're, when the, when you get a big opportunity, take advantage of it and then, and go murder. So, uh, yeah. Murder. It's like murder first. That seems to (laughs) murder. It's like you got to put the gravel in it. Murder. Murder. <laughs> <laughs> Take notes, comics. Murder first and all else. Be funny first. That's that's what a big theme in doing over 200 interviews with comics has been. With like the most successful ones is like 
just get funny first. Don't try to worry about yeah. what's the shortcut. What's how do I get around the work? It's like just be funny, and that'll create a lot of the opportunities you get. Yeah, you're going to be trying to find. Look, I've tried to find all the shortcuts. I mean, I try to do it. I'm not telling you not to go try to find them. Go try to find them, mm-hmm. and so then you can learn that they're not there on your own. But you need to learn it on your own. Uh, <laughs> You know, and always put yourself in a situation. Maybe you get a blow up. Look, I started with Aziz and sorry. I'm not like friends with him, but like I was like around his world. I mean, that dude was doing open mics with us and then was hosting the MTV Movie Awards. Like it was it was insane. Like seeing his like he just blew up immediately. Like uh, so sometimes people get lucky. They grow and they blow up. You know, Pete Davidson was when he started, he was I, I'm older than him, obviously, but he was like a kid. Yeah. And then, you know, and then he's like 20s on SNO and as a celebrity like so people have different paths you know you either make it at 20 or 40 i feel like there's <laughs> that's that's the way it goes you don't no one makes it at 30 it's either 20 or 40 but how how old are you 41 41 okay well then there's there's living testament right I there still haven't made it so oh, maybe it's 50. please you're yeah. selling out no. multiple shows at theaters man like you're killing it and you're an inspiration to all of us comics we really appreciate you doing this appreciate it do you, i appreciate do you uh do you have any closing advice or any like of your favorite comedy wisdom that you've gathered over being around the top comics in the world uh some of it like so uh be obsessed is my advice to a lot of people uh be obsessed with it okay uh work as hard as you can get up as much as you can you know it's not like you have to go sit there and write all day long but just go be out be amongst comics hang out with comics be around have a fun time drink party you know it's like we're in a field that you get a drink every night <laughs> like and that's work that's truly work like it's uh, it's hanging out and then uh you know so be obsessed that comfortable thing if you start feeling comfortable that's the best advice you can ever take if you're it wasn't mine if you start feeling comfortable it's time to make a change if you're in your comedy scene and you're the and you can feel yourself be the higher up of the scene it's time to make a change maybe you know what, whatever you can do uh you know, and the other advice for uh, this is probably more an older comics. I remember Marin always told me, be comfortable with silence. Mm. And so I think this is more it, like when I was first starting out, it's not it's not really advice that, you know, you don't need to really worry about silence. You need to try to be hearing laughs. You're only doing five, ten minutes. But when you when you start headlining for the first time, uh, it was like I learned like it's like be comfortable with silence. Be comfortable with like some pauses and like, you know, you, sometimes it's good. Uh, uh Hearing a big room of 2,000 people, you could hear a pin drop, is just as good as hearing laughter. Like, you know, because you got their attention. Yes. And so even though it shouldn't be a long thing, like I said, you want to be very close to laughs. But even if it's like 20 seconds and stuff, like, you know, when you hear that complete silence, that means, man, these people are engaged and they're really listening to what you're saying. And that's a, and that's a great, great thing. How do you create that engagement? I mean, you just got to uh, you, you feel like you're always on top of them. I feel like I never try to, you know, like I, I don't ever leave too much. Like that's the, the never being too far away from a laugh. Yeah. Like kind of, you know, you're just all you, you there's in a way there's a panic up there. And the fact that you're I always know where I'm going. I always know where you're going. I always know where you're going to begin. I always know where you're going to want to end. If you start a new joke, at least have a way to get into it and a way to get out of it. Uh, you don't want to just start a joke where you don't know how to get out of it. And you should have different exits. Like, you know, I have very I have longer jokes where I can like, I can tag it five times mm-hmm. or I can only tag it one time and, you know, and you can fill it out. Maybe if it's a good crowd, I'm going to tag it all five. If the crowd's not, you know, if it feels like they're not getting it, like other crowds, I'm only going to just tag it once and just get out of the joke. Right. So like, you just kind of fill the room out. It's all a timing is a very, you know, timing is big. It's all a very like uh, fluid kind of thing, man. Like different crowds can make you do different things. You know, you have quick laughers, you have long laughers, right. you have people that clap a lot. You have, you know, people that you feel like you got to stay on top of and you feel like you're flying. Cause you're like, I, I'm about to lose these people. You know, when you're doing a late show, slippery, you can film, start, yeah. you can film, start like looking around. Like they're like, all right. Like, you know, yeah. And they're just like, what time is it? And you're like, ah, bah, 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 and you got to like stay on them and stuff like that. There's a difference. It all changes. Yeah. There's a difference between like engaged silence. Like you said, in kind of the apathetic silence, it's a fine line, but you said you can feel them yeah. being engaged. Is it that personal material 
that makes them engage yeah, yeah. through the silence? Is that how I, you're able to? One thing, one thing I learned with personal material is I remember I had an old joke about something about me. A guy met, made a message, message me on Facebook and I was like messaged with this guy and I didn't even know who this guy was. And like it, was, it wasn't even that great of a joke. But what I always noticed, it wouldn't get the biggest laughs, but that was the joke people would always come and bring up to me after the show. Hmm. And I was like, why are they pointing out this? That's the worst joke of those sets. The other stuff murders. And it was because that's personal. So they come up to me because they're like, I've done that, dude. And so like then that joke means more to them than the other jokes that don't mean anything to them, like that are just funny. Like you can be very forgettable too. Like you can, you can watch a guy go on stage and murder, like we've been saying, <laughs> and then – no one – and you go you, – when people walk out of a room, you'd be like, hey, what, what jokes did he do? You'd be like, oh, I don't know because he, he, none of them were personal. They were all just jokes like that anybody could kind of tell. And not to say that they're not funny and that's not a good thing to do, but if you make them personal, then people are going to come up to you after the show and be like, dude, I done that. I did – yeah, I, I've done it. I've been through that exact thing. I always think that you want to be either be – you just be the dumb guy. And they can either laugh with you or laugh at you. Mm-hmm. So they're either going to laugh with you because they relate to you or they're laughing at you because you're an idiot. But both laughs count. It doesn't really matter how you laugh. So, you know, that's how I always kind of do it. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much. We actually went into overtime here. Um, so I appreciate you sharing your time. I was sure to text Mike and let him know that you said screw him and we'll go over if we need to. Chill Vecchio. So. <laughs> I'll eat all Vecchio's time. Uh, Vecchio's one of the best... Look, one of the best joke writers ever. Vecchione was like a David Pell. Yes. And, uh, I, I started with Vecchione. Me and him were at the exact same time. He's honest. He's one of my best friends. Uh, he's the best. And, uh, I mean, no one writes like he does. He's someone you need to ask about writing. Yes. That guy does it the correct way. You know, yeah. I'm uh, I'm more natural. Vecchione's, uh, uh, what's an old, I'm trying to think. He's like, yeah, I had to work really hard. Like Larry Bird. <laughs> he's like a guy that just had to. Like shoot left-handed for a whole year, uh, which I'm just joking. I'm not that. I'm not that confident. So, uh, <laughs> but Becky Young's the best. So enjoy him. Yeah, he's gonna be great. So um, Nate, thank you so much for doing this, man. We're um, we're gonna let you get on. I know you have more press to do today. So, is there anywhere you want us to go support you or check you out or anything you want to promote? Uh, yeah. I mean, just this, you know, just the, uh, the social media, all that stuff, do it, you know, all that stuff, Netflix special out mm-hmm. that's been out, you know, so whatever. Nate Bargatze, all of it's Nate Bargatze, just Google all that stuff. And, uh, so yeah, that's it. Perfect. All right. Well, Nate Bargatze, thank you for being on, um, hot breath here, buddy. Absolutely, buddy. Thank you. All man. right. Have a good day. Hey, hot brethren and sistren. If you love comedy as much as we do here at hot breath, Click the subscribe button to join the Hot breath averse and then watch more videos to get even more comedy tips. Hot Breath.